Amen. So again, I am grateful to be here. Let me do a little piece of a song that's on my heart, um, and then I'm going to um, get us into the word. Um, this is about Christ and his movement in this world. He came from the manger at Bethlehem to Calvary's cross on a mission to save the lost, steady counting the cost. He tossed riches aside to assume the drama of flesh with the weight of redemption on his back just to call us to rest. It was stress in the garden for those that are spiritually starving. Sinners with their hearts hardened get divinely pardoned. He's the sergeant of my soul, yet yeah, a captain of faith. And Christ be the door, the only way of escape. He was placed in the sinners. Do no sin. Without him, the light is dim. The situation is grim. But to them that have not, gain all in Christ. From the darkness to the light, blood robs all right. To the heights of spiritual ecstasy, joy, and peace. He placed a struggle because the blindest family now I see. Finally see me, who and where I be. And I'm in love with the king because he first loved me. Have your way, Father. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. And our text for this morning tells us in John 13, it says, Now before the festival of the Passover... Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he got up from the table. May the Lord bless us as we step into this text. I want you to notice a couple things. Jesus is in this moment of transition. Everybody say transition. Transition. Like he is in this moment of recognizing he has come to the moment of fulfillment of his destiny. He came into the world, listen to this, to give his life as a sacrifice. And he knows that he is on on his way to that moment at the feast of Passover because he is the actual lamb that would be slain for the sins of the world. And it said he stood between two windows, if you will, that as he looked into the future, he saw, listen to this, my journey is about to come to the end. Listen to this. We must recognize something about life that there is an end point to our journey. See, you can't really live until you face that moment. (laughs) That I'm not, I'm not down here on a field trip. I'm not down here just to be down here. I'm not down here with just countless time. Like there is a season to my journey which helps me lock into why am I here in the first place then? So he stepped into the window knowing that I am about to leave this world. But it also said that he was about to go to the Father. So he had some bad news that was in front of him. I'm about to die. But he also had some good news that I'm about to be back where I came from, where I will be back in the presence of the Father. But listen to what Jesus did. He stepped away from both of those moments. And I think this is beautiful for us because listen to this. Death didn't terrorize him. Listen to this. When, When you get into moments where fear begins to arrest you and grip you, listen to this. Fear will stop you from living out your destiny. The stuff that you are afraid of happening, the stuff that's up the road, listen to this, that's not going to move. You got to know that God called us and he said, listen, I ain't promising everything going to be easy. Brother, I ain't promising when you go down there and you do this stand that you ain't going to go to jail. You might go to jail, but will you go for me and the causes that I want to stand up for in this world? So Jesus was unmoved by the bad news that he was confronted with. But he also, in face of the good news, he didn't go drift off into fantasy land. See, sometimes when we start thinking about all of the good stuff that could happen and stuff, and we get so futuristic that we'll forget, listen to this, where I'm at right now. (laughs) We try to escape the present moment because we try to drift off into a place where it'll be better off in the by and by. Listen to this. One of the main goals of the movement of Christ is not just to get us to heaven. Listen to this. He said, I got some stuff I want to do in your life right now. We going to heaven, but listen to this. I got to use your life right now in this world. And listen to this. I am claiming ownership over your life. The scripture tells us this way. He said that he gave his life so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for he who died and was raised again. See, there's a purpose for our lives. And I said the goal is not just to get us to heaven. The goal is that we might be conformed into the image of Christ. 
Listen to this right now. That, that Christ would listen to what he would do. He would put us on as clothing, right? He would wear us. He would be down on the inside going about in this world, standing up for justice, standing up for the law, standing up for the hurt. He would run to where the pain is. See, I see that's why my boy Mike, they, we got to go back to Ferguson. They still hurting over there. And that is nothing really but the call of Jesus. Listen to this, beckoning down on the inside. I love what God does because he is the great interrupter. He will interrupt your comfort zone. He'll interrupt your fantasy land. He'll interrupt your fears and he'll interrupt you in a way to where he will call for a demand upon your very life that it might be submitted to him and he will send you places, listen to this, that you really didn't want to go. But, 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 but listen, he got to put us in certain positions, right? Like certain positions so that he would squeeze out of us what he's tucked off on the inside. There's some stuff that's in you that you won't even recognize is in you until you get into some difficult places to where God begins to squeeze out of you the very heart of what's in you. I don't know. How many of y'all seen the movie Jerry Maguire? Okay. So in, in this movie, there was an important piece to me because in this movie, it's all about this football player who was trying to get a contract and get a new contract. He had an agent, and this agent was going through his own, own turmoil and trying to figure out, listen to this, who he was. And they were trying to get a new contract, and so they sent this offer to the coaches, and the coaches sent back something else, and it wasn't what the family wanted. This husband and wife was wanting some real money. And the contract came to like, we can't live off that. And the agent said... Well, hey, this is kind of maybe the best you're going to get. You might as well just take this. And the wife stood up. She like, well, hold on a second. We ain't hire you just to settle for what they want to give us. We want to get what belongs to us and what we're worth. And she said this to him. Tell me, what do you stand for? She was asking him, man, who are you? Like, are you really going to represent us? Are you really going to stand in the position for which we hired you for, for what we have? Listen to this word, called you to be on our team for. I believe that's what God is saying right now to the body of Christ. We got difficult times that we're living in. In this world, there's a world filled with chaos. And he's looking at the church saying, who are you? Y'all going to stand for that? You're going to watch all that happening in the world, and you know, listen to this, what I came to do, how I came to break into the darkness and bring about a light like the church is, a city that's supposed to be set up on the hill. <laughs> We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. When the earth is, listen to this, not just to make stuff taste good, right? Like salt back then was a preserving agent. Like you had to put the salt on the meats because they ain't had no refrigerators back then. <laughs> and so the salt was the way that we could have some leftovers. Somebody say leftovers. <laughs> We got to keep some stuff. That's some stuff that's decaying unless God sprinkle us on it. And so that means he got to shake us out into some places that we would rather not be so that, listen to this, he say, this ain't about you. He said, this is about me going where the hurt is, where the need is. And since I'm in you, I got to send you to go on my behalf. There's a scripture in the book of Exodus as God was talking to Moses. And he told Moses, he said, listen to this, Moses. I'm ready to move now. He says, I have seen the suffering of my people. I have seen their oppression. I have seen the things that they're going through and how they have been under torment by the hand of the enemy. He said, listen to this. I'm about to come down and fix this. But listen to what I'm going to do, Moses. Come here because I'm about to send you. So you got to hear what he said. God says, I'm coming down, but I'm sending you. My presence is going to come where that hurt is and where that pain is, but you my hands and feet. I got to use your body, your life, your lips. See, this is why he calls for a surrender. There are gifts and talents. You have been wired in a way that God would put you in the right location, in the right position, so that he might use your life for kingdom purposes. But we got to get over ourselves to do that. I, I love what God has been doing in my own journey as I even think about the call on my own life. Like, again, I told you a little bit about the football thing and me seeking that. And as God began to call me, he began to make some promises to me. He began to tell me kind of what he wanted to use my life for. And along the journey, um, there have been glimpses and, and moments, even at brief moments, of me seeing a little bit of, listen to this word, who I was. Listen to this. We, we don't just want to go be a people who go do something. We want to be people first who are something. Because, yeah. see, see, Jesus is more intentional about who you be. I know that's not good English, but you understand what I'm saying. Like, who are you? 
Because, see, when you understand who you are, then you can step into your purpose. See, this is one of the reasons why Jesus was able to move because, listen, he knew who he was. See, we suffer as Christians even with an identity crisis. We don't know how to get in our lane and fit into the world and be who we're supposed to be so that the power of Christ can be released because some of us, we play and we get too churchy. Well, see, see, we've heard the scripture, though, or not scripture, but a statement that people say that you so heavenly minded, you know, earthly good. And I believe that's part of what Jesus did. He saw glory. He saw returning back to the father. But he said, hold on a second. I'm right here and I got to do something right here. But there's also another side of it. You could be so worldly minded that you're no heavenly good. Heaven can't use you because you're so fixed on what the here and now is. And so it takes God to give you that perfect balance. Yeah. To be, listen to this, in the world, but not of the world, right, right? So that we could be used for God's glory in this world, but we're not following the heartbeat of this world. The world is after stuff, but he wants us to be after Christ and his glory. And so God has to take us to some places and put us in some positions to squeeze out of us what he's put in us. And so as I thought about my own journey, like recently, God has been moving my heart in some different ways. Um, and I'm going to give you a quick little synopsis. Like I, I, I was part of Oakland City Church, um, and we started that church about five years ago. Myself, Joshua McPaul, um, a white and a black pastor coming together in a city that's pretty much divided, not just around race lines, but economic lines, educational lines. And if the kids kingdom of God is the kingdom of God, which means all people need to dwell together, right? In God's eyes, he sees sons and daughters. I'm going to talk to the lights. In God's eyes, he sees sons and daughters. He don't necessarily see black, white, Latino, Asian, though we have our distinctions, right? God loves us all equally wherever culture we come from because he has a people in every culture. That's what he saw. That's what the writer in Revelation said. I saw people from every tribe, kindred, and tongue. And listen to this. It wasn't so much about them when I saw them, but all of them was gathered around the Lamb. All of them were in worship to who he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so as that church got started coming across those lines and calling all people to Christ, um, it, it was a beautiful and a difficult journey. Because, um, you know, sometimes, you know, coming from my own culture and background, especially even in church, it would be tough talking to a group of people and I wouldn't get no feedback. I wouldn't get an amen, a hallelujah, a thank you. I, I wouldn't even get an eye bat sometime. And that was difficult. <laughs> but I understood later that they heard me more than I thought they did. They just listened a little bit different. But then at the same time as I was there and I'm like, okay, this has been a beautiful journey. God began to burden my heart about the state of our young people. I am 42 years old. And out of my 42 years of living, my father been in prison probably about 35 of those years if you put it all together. So I was a young person growing up by trial and error. Like football actually helped me. It helped me stay out of the streets. He got coaches in my life to speak into my life. And like God used that. And so God began to change the direction of my heart. And he sent me into juvenile hall to start doing a Bible study. And it was crazy how it started, though. I'm going to talk to you. I'm still on point with the God want to squeeze some stuff out of you that you didn't even know was in you. So I go to the juvenile hall, do the orientation, and I meet with the chaplain. And the chaplain says, hey, man, come in. on This was Thursday. He says, come in on Monday. I do a Bible study in the max unit. I want you to just come and watch and observe. You don't have to do nothing, but I just want you to see the flow so that you can kind of get in the rhythm and we'll work on you getting a schedule. So I show up on that Monday. I got my Bible in my hand, but I'm not planning on teaching anything. I go into the juvenile hall in the max unit, and the max unit is for you who don't know. Most of the young people in there are adult remands, which means once they turn 18, they go off to adult prison. They've been given more time than they can spend in juvenile hall. So I'm going into a dark and difficult and a very questioning moment in young people's lives. I go into the Bible study, prepared to sit down and listen. He tells me, hey, man, I got some stuff going on, some people I got to meet at the gate. So um, I'm going to just let you lead the Bible study. And he closed the door. Boop. <laughs> and here I am now with about nine young brothers looking at me, and I'm unprepared. But listen, I was prepared. Right? God had something in me. I started talking. They started asking questions. I started sharing rap verses. And before I knew it, an hour and a half had passed. And the guard was knocking on the door saying, man, you, you got five minutes. Like, you got to come on out of there. What I felt in that moment was they didn't want me to leave. And I didn't want to leave. And I felt God put a call up on my heart saying, Larry, what about them? Like, like 
the, the, the grandma church ain't talking to them. Grandma church is talking about them. You know that place that you were in when you were young, you didn't think Jesus was, was central to life. You thought that was for when you get older, you need Jesus because that's for my grandma and them. But where is the church that wants to talk to that generation? That wants to elevate that generation. That wants to lift them up into their purpose and their destiny. And God began to change the course of my heart. Had some conversations. And then my church heard the call and said, hey, well, let's send you. So now I am now moving into West Oakland to plant a new church called Elevate. Where God would raise his people. You know they call West Oakland the bottoms. God said, not so. Let's elevate that. Let's lift that up. And so God will position us to get something out of us that he has tucked into us for his purposes and his glory. So I love what the text says because it says about Jesus he did not have an identity crisis. It said that he knew that all things have been placed under his control. He knew he was in absolute authority. And he also knew that he was headed somewhere and he had come from somewhere. When you know who you are, when you get a sense of your true identity, listen to this. In Christ, you will stand up even in the midst of difficult situations. Listen to this. When Paul, who's one of the greatest examples of what it looks like to be a human, surrendered to the will of God, because I don't know about you, I know that had to be difficult to get called to preach Christ and you would go to some places and you would actually get a whooping. Like, they would whoop this cat out of the city. Hold on a second. I don't know what it's like to be a grown man to get a whooping. <laughs> and then to pick himself up and go to the next city and preach the same thing that got him whooped in that city, that means I'm sold out to Christ. And that just ain't a song. That is the very cadence of my life. God wants it all. Because, listen, he gave all to us. The identity crisis that most of us suffer from is we don't know who we really are. I'm not talking about a Christian. That's a label we can put on ourselves. No, who are you? Like, what did God call you to do? What gifts has he given you? What visions, what call has he placed on your life that you shrink back from? Like some things that you have kind of put on the shelf, if you will. I talked a little bit about the CD that's coming out on September 26th. I had stopped rapping. Listen to this. I've got saved in 1995. I started rapping then. Listen to this. Right now, I'm like too old to be rapping. <laughs> like it's kind of like this ain't your turn no more, man. Let them do it. <laughs> but God said, no, you. There's something in you right now. And listen to this. God has a way of waiting you out. The promises he makes to you, he got to prepare you to live in that promise. Because if he would have sent me earlier when I was so gung-ho trying to do it and trying to be somebody, and like the old folks used to say at the church, trying to be a wonder, I would have messed up some stuff. Because though it was about him, it was still about me. So God has a way of waiting you out to where you ain't even thinking about doing it no more. And then he say, now nah, I'm ready to do it. Let's go. Because now it's going to be about me and about my glory. So, you know, that's what he did with, with Jacob. He already had the promise, but God had to meet him and, and make him limp on his way to go do the thing that he needed to do. But listen to this. God says, I need everything from you. I want to close in a moment with this thought process. What has God called you to do? I think about the greatness of this movement and how God has raised my brother Mike up in a particular way, in a particular passion, a particular vein. Listen to this. Everybody is not called to do that. He is in his lane. That's why the doors are opening. That's why it's just, it's just flourishing because he has hit the stride. He has gone through tests and challenges. He is imperfect, but he is perfectly where he's supposed to be. And listen to this. God is using him as a surrendered vessel. But the charge to this community here is not to just watch him do his, his thing. The charge to this community is what is your thing that God has called you to do so that you might live that out for his purposes. God has destiny in front of you. Listen to this. He says that you have been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God is passionate. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says he has peculiarly grabbed him a people who he has first of all saved from sin and he has called them to be his own possession that he might have for himself a people who are passionate about good works there's a way that you've been wired I understand football because um, in football we would have to encourage one another in the middle of the game 
Like, 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 I'm not playing your position. I'm a defensive back. You a linebacker, man. You got to tackle that running back. But my job is to, in the middle of the game, sometime I got to take a moment to encourage you, man, do your job, brother. That's what this moment is, I believe. That God would call me into the locker room, if you will. That he would help me look at my teammates who are on the battlefield in different ways, in different places, with different callings and different lanes. But I'm here to tell you, run your lane. Whatever God got for you to do, man, do that thing with everything that you have. Because, listen, the time is ticking. We don't have forever. Like Jesus was facing a moment where he knew death was impending on the clock. And he knew glory was awaiting for him. And so what he was in that moment, and I love the way the text says, he looked at all of that and he stood up from the table. And what did he do when he stood up from the table? He began to touch his disciples. He began to wash their feet, if you will. That's what ministry is. There are people who are out there, listen to this, dirty in sin, who've been walking along life's path and have gotten mud on their feet. What Jesus did in that moment was to really give them their assignment that as I leave this world, you need to do what I'm doing. Jesus was not just a great teacher. He wasn't just a great model. Jesus was the picture for us of what it looks like to be a human being surrendered to the will of God. Listen, he didn't just come to die for us. He came to live for us so that we might see what we are, or were originally intended to be. He always came down and as he was here, he was always seeking to do the father's will. His vertical game was strong. And that made his horizontal game even stronger. He spent much time with the father, no matter what he was facing, whatever moment he was in, he would always reach up here so that he would have the power to do what he needed to do down here. And so he becomes our model, our picture of what it looks like to be in the face of difficulties and say, but nevertheless, not my will. Let your will be done. Listen to this. With my life. Now, I know it's a challenge sometimes to get this image right of what it looks like for us to surrender. Um, and I have challenges sometimes um, letting um, possessions that belong to me be dictated by somebody else. Like some, sometimes my, my, I got my car and my wife got a car and then sometimes my, ride, my wife ride with me or my daughter get in the car with me and they get to touching my knobs. <laughs> Music and air conditioning and it, 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 it do something to me on the inside. <laughs> Because listen to this, this is my stuff, and you in here riding with me, but you want to control the stuff that I'm supposed to control. But that's what it's like for Jesus to get in your car, and for him to tell you, scoot over to the passenger seat, and let me get behind the wheel and begin to listen to this. I don't want to listen to that music, let's turn this on. I don't want the heat at that control, let's turn it down right here. And for you not to sit there with your arms folded. But you to listen to this, you to get in your heart that he knows what's best. Because not only is he worried about the conditions of the car that we're driving in, but he's more interested in the destination of where we're headed. Sometimes we get so caught up in where we are and what we're dealing with, we don't understand what he's trying to take us to so he can do something through us. He has a purpose for our lives. And he says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to bring you to an expected end. Plans not to harm you, but to bless you. Though you might be in situations that seem like you won't rise up out of this, but no, I got resurrection power. There's nothing that can keep you from what I got for you. There's nothing that can turn you away from the destiny that I have for you because there's purpose on your life and I'm faithful to my word. The Bible says he is watching over his word to perform it. Whatever word he's spoken in your life, you got to reclaim that word. He is not going to fail. None of the promises that he have made will fail. Every promise in him is yes and amen. You got to get that down in your spirit. As you're walking through your situation, and it might be difficult, because you know that word in Jeremiah that I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you was a plan to send them into chaos. It was a plan that they was finna head into difficulty. They wasn't headed in the easy street. He was telling them, I'm finna send you a place you don't even know, and you're gonna be there, but I want you to know that I got plans for you. Listen to this, right here. Right in the hurt, right in the pain, right when you begin to surrender your life to the call of God in your life, and it takes you places that you would rather not be, but God said, here is my will for you, that I might get something out of you. Because when he sends us in difficult places, that helps our posture. 
it, it helps us because I become uncomfortable because I'm no longer in control. I'm no longer able to just have it my way. I can't run from where he's calling me to because life, God will turn life upside down on you. If you try to run from the thing he called you to, you, you are in for some trouble. In this trouble, you bring it on yourself. He will flip life upside down to get you where he wants you to be so you can do the thing because he's saying, you're wasting my time. I got something to do, and I need your life to do it in, and so this is why I need your surrender. And so God says the cadence right now is we got to pick it up. Each individual in the kingdom of God has to do a survey on the inside to say, man, who am I? Who am I in the kingdom? What gifts has God given me? How has he wired me in a particular way so that I might serve my purpose on this team for the greater glory of God in this world? Because we see the times are getting darker. The challenges is rising even deeper to where the real church has to come forth. And he's given us what we need to go into this world to set the captives free. But we got to um, turn the volume up. I'm closing with this last thought. I was at this concert last night, and I, I started off, and, and one of the songs came on, and it was a lot of movement and a lot of dancing going on. And, and after the song, I was like, man, y'all turning up with me in here. And this is what I said. I said, you know, like, we who believe in Christ are the only ones who got a right to be turned up. Everybody else in the world should be turned down right now. If you are not resting in Christ and in the promises of Christ to have your sins washed away and life restored, you got problems right now. You need to turn everything down. But the challenge for us is we not turned up loud enough. I remember there would be moments in my journey when I was younger and I was dreaming of having cars with the good music in it that, that make everybody in the neighborhood hear it. But there would be certain times you at the light and somebody come to you next with one of those cars and y'all at the light and you could hear their music over your music. And you would kind of turn yours down so you could hear what they listening to. God said, that's not to be so in the church. The music they playing, that ain't the music of the Holy Spirit. It's not the music that God is after. The world has a volume that is turned up so loud about everything but Jesus. Yeah. It's going to be hard for us to really live out this Christian thing in this world because the loudness of the world, they don't want to hear this. But we have to respond with our volume turned up even louder. Because listen to this, they need to hear what we have to say. And listen to this, that's not just the preacher's job. Yeah. You, you've been assigned to places. You have to look at everything as a moment and an act of worship. That every place is a place of ministry. That your gifts, if it take you to Wall Street, serve Christ on Wall Street. Yeah. If it takes you to do hair at the hair shop, be in the hair shop doing hair, serving Christ. No matter where you are, like he says that, listen, that whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Do it with an eye upon his majesty, upon what he gave up for us so that we might, listen to this, give him glory, not just with our lips, but with our lives. So, 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 so turn down for what? I believe that was the very heartbeat of Jesus when he knew death is coming. Glory is also on the way. But I'm going to live right now in this moment. My people need me. And it says he got up from the table. I believe that was a moment of let me do what I'm assigned to do. Let me lean into my purpose. Let me not turn down because of the fear. And let me not drift off in the fantasy land because of the promises that await me. Let me seize the moment. The Bible says redeem the time. Like I got to take full advantage of the time that he's given me because I don't know when my chapter closes. But I want to live out the call he has on my life to where Paul said at the end of his journey, I have finished my course. Do you know what your course is? Do you know what your call is? Do you know what God has wired you to do so that you can begin to be about the vision that God has for you? Or else, listen to this, we're just walking around in circles. we actually wasting time. But if you would get into the presence of God, that God would begin to fill you with deeper desires that are bigger than what you want to do with your life. But that it will be the plan that he has for your life and he could take you places that you never imagined you would be. And he will use your life in ways that you never thought that you could be used. Listen to this. With all of your brokenness, not with your perfections. Much of the glory of God is going to be revealed through the people that he uses who are humble enough to know, I didn't want to do this in the first place. 
but he's equipped me and given a burden to me that oversees the burden I had about my own stuff. And I am now compelled to do what he wants me to do. I'm closing with this scripture and we're going to pray. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul had just finished talking about death and that it was on his way. And he began to talk to a group of people and he said these words. He says, listen, I know y'all feel like I'm doing too much. Like I'm taking this Jesus thing too, too heartily. Like I'm too, I'm over the top about this Jesus thing. And he said, listen to this. It's the love of Christ that is constraining me or pushing me to do this. The word constrain gives us an image of what we do with toothpaste. That, you know, toothpaste that, that we squeeze and stuff comes out. And there are moments when we get to the toothpaste, for those of you who will be honest with me, that you're like, I ain't finna go buy no new toothpaste because I know it's still some in this bottle right here, this toothpaste. And what we do most times is we'll roll that thing up and start squeezing out of it what we know is still in there. God says some of the difficulties you're facing right now is him rolling up that toothpaste. There's some stuff that's in you that got to come out. There's other people's destiny tied to you, listen to this, coming to be who you're supposed to be. When that movie that I mentioned earlier, when they questioned that brother about who are you, are you going to just settle for what you see? That ain't what we, that we supposed to have. And that brother got awakened to his true purpose. And that brother did his simple role. It wasn't super grandiose, but he stood in his position and did what he was supposed to do. And listen to this, life was changed. You are somebody else's destiny opener. The doors that they're waiting on, you got to get in your position. <laughs> they waiting on you to arrive so that they could cross paths with you and hear and feel and be pushed into the places that they're supposed to be. So as I, as I close, God says, I'm squeezing some stuff out of you. Because he says, I know what I want to do in your life, but I need you to stop thinking so much. Start listening some more. Stop, stop trying to figure your way out and start trusting your way into the things that I want to happen for you. Father, I thank you. I thank you that this moment is a moment of purpose. There are some people in this room who have fell asleep on their own purpose. They have fallen asleep on their own destiny. They have gotten caught up into the, the, the motion of life. They're, they're, they're waking up. They're going to work or going to school. They're paying bills. They're coming home. They're cooking dinner. They're raising kids. And those things are right to do. But there is a purpose beyond our day-to-day -day existence that you're after. And many times you want to activate us right in those things to begin to live life in a different way. To live with a different rhythm, with a different cadence. And so, Father, I pray that even now you would awaken people to their true identity in you. First, as sons and daughters. Secondly, as those who have been given gifts. You said that you have given gifts for the sake of ministry, for the building of your kingdom. There are people in here who are sitting down, but they should be standing up. There are people in here who are, who are walking on pathways that's not their path, but you want to change the course of their life. There are people in here who are supposed to be speaking, but they're still silent. There are people here who are supposed to be active in service in this community, and they're still looking around trying to find the perfect opportunity. God, would you push them into the destiny that you have for them? Because you're not so much interested in, in, in where we go to do the thing we've been called to do. But you're interested in us doing it. Sometimes it, it, it looks like us doing it from a jail cell. Pa Paul was in, in, in jail and, and, and he had that same statement. It was like, turn down for what? I'm, st I'm in this position, but they went to singing and they went to praising God in the midst of a difficult moment. And something happened right there. God, the places you send us to, we just have to be more focused on who you are, not just where we are, but who you are. And, and, and we in you are more than conquerors. So, Father, today, would you release some people? 
to step into the vision you have for their lives today. God, would you call some people forward? And so as we're standing, as we're in this moment, I would have those who feel like uh, I just need to get where God wants me to be. I just I just want to step into that. I've been kind of just circling around, kind of waiting my turn. But I feel like this is a moment. This is a decisive moment. And I want to be pushed into the very thing that God has for me. I just want you to come down towards the front. I just want you to come to the front. If you're saying, listen, I just want God's will for me. I just want to do what he wants me to do. I just want to surrender to his will. I don't want to try to figure everything out. I don't want to try to have everything perfect. I just want to step into what God is calling me into. And I feel like I don't want to wait no longer. I want to redeem the time and get caught up in his vision for my life. I want to live out my purpose. I know the clock is ticking. I know that he is calling for his church as he did Lazarus to come forth. To come forth into our destiny. This is your moment. This is your moment to simply say with your feet, I surrender. Here am I, Lord. I'm not going to try to plan out my course and and hand to you what I want to do. But I simply want to be in a place for you to tell me what you have for me to do. So that the rest of the time that I have on the clock would be spent for your purposes, for your glory. That the rest of the time that I have, the rest of my season will be lived for your reasons. See, Jesus is so beautiful because he gives us a reason why. That we are more than what we do. We are his children. We are sons and daughters. We are a royal priesthood. We are a chosen generation. We are a people who are supposed to show forth with our lives the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into life. Our lives are supposed to look like something. Not just because of what we're doing, it's because of who we are. The lights get turned on from the inside. And as I see who he is more clearly and as I, as I see more clearly who I am, I'm able to move in ways that I didn't even imagine I can move in. I can do things that I didn't even imagine that I can do. There's still some time before we jump into this prayer. For those who want to respond with your feet and say, Jesus, I want to just give you more. There's some areas that I've been keeping from you. There's some places that I know you've told me to go, but I've let other things keep me from those places. I know there's some people you wanted me to talk to, but I've been letting fear and and worries about how we'll be received. And and I am actually not just holding myself back from my purpose. I'm holding them back from their purpose because they need to hear from you. And your word is alive in me. And I don't want to just say on the sideline, it's time for me to enter the game. It's time for me to get on the field and and do my part. (laughs) And add my law to the fire that the flame of God's glory will be established in this cold world. That there will be people who will be awakened to their purpose because I'm stepping into my purpose. This is a moment of destiny. Would you come forward? Would you come forward? It's simply your yes. It's the response of a yes in your soul that says, yes, God, to your will. Yes, God, to your way. Yes, God, to your heartbeat for me. Yes, God, to your plan. Yes, God, to your vision. Yes, God, to your purposes. Take the driver's seat, oh God. I'll take the passenger seat, God. Take the driver's seat of my life. Begin to take me where you want me to be. Begin to shape me and mold me how you want me to be. Begin to awaken the gifts and the callings that are in my heart, God, for your very purposes, God. Use me for your glory. Here I am, a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is important because a living sacrifice has to come and present itself to the altar. It has to say, here am I, Lord. I understand the very call that you have on my life and that we will become just like the Apostle Paul that we stood before the revelation of Christ and the Apostle Paul simply said what would you have me to do and that's what we're saying as we're standing here before him is Lord what would you have me to do I am your servant God I I am I have been purchased with a price God I am no longer my own and I actually since I know that I want to live that out now God here am I Use me, oh God. Use me to get glory in this world. Use me, God. 
I know I don't have much to offer. I know I'm broken by myself, but God, here am I. Would you use me for your glory? Open doors that are supposed to be open for me, God. Close the doors that need to be shut. Awaken the gifts that are down on the inside so that purpose might be fulfilled. That the rest of my time, God, is spent in mission with you. That's what we were intended to be. A people for your own possession who are zealous for good works. We are intentional. We are on purpose trying to do what pleases you, God. Would you bless my brothers and sisters who've come forward? Would you bless them? Would you raise those hands? I'm just standing here at the altar. Father, this hand that is raised is simply a yes to your will. This hand that is raised, Father, is simply a recognition that I know that you are on the throne. And I know that all things belong to you, oh God. So I include myself into your treasure of possessions. And I'm saying to you, make me over again. Do a new thing down in my heart, oh God. Restore unto me the joy of what it means to live for you. Bring me back to the former days where you were the only thing that matters, oh God. Let the dullness that has come upon my heart be washed away. Make me alive. Make me a lively stone in the building, oh God. That my purposes might come to fruition. I don't want to waste my life, God. I'm not here on a field trip. I am here on your purposes, God. I am here to do what you have called me to do, oh God. Awaken in me every desire. Awaken in me fresh affections for your glory. Awaken in me new uh, uh, courage, God, to stand in my position, oh God. Awaken in me a new sense of your calling on my life, oh God. That I would go forward and that many would come to know you. Because I got turned up about my purpose. I turned the volume up on my life being lived for your glory. May, may we get what you had as you went to the temple, Jesus. When your parents came back looking for you, you said to them, didn't you know that i got to be about my father's business? Would you awaken that in us <laughs> to be about your business, oh God, in this world? To live our lives with an intentionality to serve you in the way that you've called all of us. And so, Father, we thank you that you want to do this. That that's what this moment is all about, that you are calling us forward into purpose. I thank you for the destiny of your people who will go to the grave empty, who will go to the grave having done the things that you've called us to do, that we would go to the grave, God, exhausted in the purposes that you have for us, God, that we wouldn't go to the grave still filled with all of these gifts and talents, but we would expend our energy, God, doing the thing that you created us to do, oh God. That we would spend our energy, God, doing what you've called us to do, God. That this world would be a better and a different place. When you take us out of the salt shaker and begin to sprinkle us on the stuff that's decaying in this world. That the preserving element of your word... And your spirit, God, will come through us. That there will be a people and a generation that is lost will be called out of the darkness into the marvelous light. And Father, we'll be careful to give you the praise that belongs to you. Because we know it's going to be done by you. One plants, one waters, but it's you who gives increase, God. But we want to just say that we want you to use us. We want it. We want it your way. Have your way. Have your way in our lives. Have, our, have your way in our purposes. Have your way in our finances. Have your way in our education. Have your way in our career choices, God. Have your way. Lead us where you want us to go. And give us the grace to follow you. Even into the difficult places. Wherever it takes for you to get the glory that you so rightfully deserve. We thank you, Father, and we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Give the Lord a hand praise. Give the Lord a hand praise as you prepare to take your seat. Give the Lord a praise. Father, we thank you. God, you're awesome. God, you're mighty. God, you're holy. God, you're powerful. God, you are on purpose, God. Shine through us. <laughs>
for the glory of Christ. Amen. And thank God.